Testing. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to CS3510. Uh, um, algorithms, of course. Uh, the topic of today's letter, lecture is called Chain Matrix Multiplication. Um, so uh, today we're going to really do one DP problem, a single dynamic programming problem. And it's kind of a little obscure, and uh, how important it is is, a, a, is kind of subjective. Uh, it's a technique that solves one problem, and the problem, the, tech, the technique applies so rarely and so obscurely that we really can't find too many problems to put on homeworks, practice exams, or the exam. There's like one good problem for each of these. We can only think of like three problems. Um, so then there's a question of like how, if this technique uh, is so obscure, you know, why learn it? And I've always thought about that, you know, independent of how interesting it is, you're supposed to be learning bread and butter techniques to help you solve problems. If this is such an obscure technique, why are we learning it? And then last semester, a guy came up to me after class and was like, thank you so much for teaching chain matrix multiplication because it was the interview question and had I not seen it, uh, I would never have got that question. And it is one of those problems, like if I phrase a problem to you, there's, I would bet there's no way anyone would be able to come up with the solution, uh, the DP solution, at least by themselves. So it's certainly a really contrived um, uh, problem, and it solves uh, really just one problem. Um, chain matrix multiplication has nothing to do with ma multiplying matrices. We're really concerned with the order of multiplying matrices. So we're not actually going to be concerned with uh, matrix multiplication. Suppose we have the following matrices. We have a 50 by, let's say, 20. We'll call this A. And then we have a 20 by 1. And then we have a 1 by 10. We'll call this B. Let's call this C. We'll say 1 by 10. And then we have a 10 by 100. Call this D. So these are four matrices. We've really only restricted ourselves to the concern of multiplying square matrices simply because that's like nice and easy. Um, but of course, you guys know how to multiply rectangular matrices, right? What you do is you take the dimension, the, you take the column, and then you flip it up and you rotate it, and you dot product with the row, and that'll give you the value of an element on that row. Um, so the number of rows is the dimension of the column. And you do that for each one. Now, the number of columns of, the, of A has to be equal to the number of rows of B in order for the multiplication make, to make sense, right? That's the only way you can multiply rectangular matrices. Multiplying square matrices is, I mean, they're square, so it doesn't matter. Uh, you can always multiply them because you assume that they both have dimension N. But when you multiply rectangular matrices, there's, of course, uh, one way you can multiply it. For example, here you can compute AB, but you cannot compute BA. Do you agree? Um, uh, given that, there, it, it's still interesting of a question of like, what order should you multiply them in. Uh, you want to multi the, the problem of chain matrix multiplication is not how do you multiply matrices. It's not an algorithm for multiplying matrices. In fact, the input to the algorithm doesn't even give you the matrices. It only gives you the dimensions of the matrices. The question is, what order should you multiply the matrices in? And by order, I mean, for example, let's say you do A and B first, and then you do C, and then you do D. That's one way to do it, right? Matrix multiplication is associative. So you could choose to do A, B first, and then do C, and then do D. Or you could choose to do a, B first, then C, D, and then multiply those together. You could choose to do uh, B, C, uh, then A, uh, and then D. You could choose to do B, C, uh, then D, then A. Um, there's probably one more. You could choose to do... Um, uh, C, D first, and then B, uh, and then A, right? So there's at least for these, at least for four matrices, there's at least five ways to multiply them together. And we're concerned with, like, what is the way to, which is the fastest way to multiply the matrices? 
And by fastest, what we're going to do is create a cost function and ballpark the cost of multiplying matrices. And we're going to use that to uh, determine a cost of multiplying matrices. So first off, what is a good, what is a good cost function of like multiplying just two matrices? Suppose you have matrix uh, A of dimensions D0 and D1. So what this means is A is a D0 by D1 matrix, right? And let's suppose you have matrix B of dimensions D1 by D2, right? So there's three numbers involved here. Matrix A has dimensions D0, D1. So it's a D0 by D1. And then matrix B has dimensions D1 by D2. So it's a D1 by D2, right? Um, and of course, because uh, the number of columns of A is the number of rows of B, you can multiply these two square matrices, right? Um, what's a good cost function? To, like, like, let's say we want to ballpark the number of operations it takes, not in big O or anything, but the number of operations it takes to multiply two matrices in terms of their dimension. Well, what is a good uh, cost function? So let's, let's just call it cost of D0, a D1, a D2. Um, so given, let's suppose we're concerned with the, 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 the notion of square matrices first. And maybe we have some good understanding of the asymptotics of matrix multiplication for square matrices. Let's take that idea and try and generalize it a little bit. Do you guys remember what was the, what was the, uh, the best runtime we said exists for square matrix multiplication, of two square matrix multiplications? Fixed point arithmetic, multiplying two numbers takes unit time, but we're concerned perhaps with the number of operations it takes. Do we remember, sort of even have a, 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 a range? We gave several estimates. N cubed was uh, done with Gaussian elimination. But we did give some better ones. We did mention, yeah? N to the 2.79, uh, that might be right, but I thought it was N to the 2.81. I, I actually, it might be 2.79. Um, then we mentioned the best was like N to the 2.386 or something currently. And there's a conjectured lower bound of N squared, but we don't know how to reach it. And you know, as we reduce smaller and smaller asymptotics off the things, there's probably N to the 2.79 algorithm that someone found before they found faster ones. Um, this is not really like an effective cost function to concern ourselves with these faster and faster matrix multiplication algorithms, because n is not one number now, but three numbers. So actually, if we were to consider only the Gaussian, let's just simplify things and simplify our cost function, and therefore simplify the entire GP problem. If we're considering that Gaussian elimination, elimination takes n cubed operations, n cubed steps, it takes O of n cubed steps, but let's just suppose it's just raw n cubed. What is a good cost function for two square matrices which have dimensions d0, d1, and d1, d2? Yeah. That's going to end up being our cost function. And that's definitely better than con compared to, I don't know, like d0 plus d1 plus d2 or something like this. So our cost function to multiply matrices A and B of d0, d1, and d1, d2 is going to be d0, d1, d2. Now again, you could redo the whole DP problem with uh, the cost function is used sort of as a black box. And that's just our ballpark. Um, but you could replace the cost function perhaps with a better one. But you should still get the same answer, right? The cost, like having it like a less optimal cost function should not make it so that the association you pick uh, of these, which one is the minimum number of operations, um, it shouldn't lead you to a worse answer because it makes all of the answers the same worseness and the function is also monotonic, right? Uh, let's give some examples of some associations. So consider first we multiply BC. And then we're going to multiply D. And then we'll multiply A. I'll leave off the last parentheses just to make it a little clearer. Um, what is the cost of multiplying A, B, C, and then D, and then A? Uh, what are we going to do? We're going to do 20 times 1 times 10 for B, C. So that's going to be 200 plus. And now notice when you multiply uh, 20 times 1 by 1 by 10, 
you get a matrix, and what do you get as the size of your matrix? It's going to be 20 by 10, right? So you're going to get a 20 by 10 matrix, right? Now you're going to have a 20 by 10 matrix times a 10 by 100 matrix. So that's going to be 20 times 10 times 100. Do you guys see that? This is going to be uh, 20 times 10. And then this is going to be, of course, 10 times 100. So what is a 20 by 10 uh, by 100? That's going to be 20 times 10 is going to be 200 times 100 is going to be 2,000, 20,000. Uh, plus, and then that's going to give us a 20 uh, times 100 matrix. And A is a 50 by 20 matrix. So we're going to get a 50, 50 times 20 times 100. What is 50 times 20 times 100? Someone do this math for me. 50 times 20 times 100? 100,000? That sounds right. Right? So if you multiply the matrices in this order, you're going to get like uh, 120,200. That's kind of a lot, so maybe that's not the best way. Let's consider a different association. Let's suppose we didn't multiply by D first. Let's suppose we chose to multiply by A first, right? Something like that. Um, well, let's do the cost again. This is going to be B times C is going to go first. It's going to be 200. But then we're going to have a 20 by 10, and we're going to multiply that on the front by a 50 by 20. So it's going to be 50 by 20 by 10. What is 50 times 20 times 10? Fifty times twenty times ten is five hundred times twenty, which is a thousand times ten, which is ten thousand. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of little numbers in today's lecture, so please do it with me and make sure I don't make any mistakes. I don't want to miss a zero or something. If I do, everything's going to be off. So then we're going to be left with a fifty by fifty times ten, and then we're going to multiply that by a ten by a hundred. So that's going to be fifty times ten times a hundred which is going to be 500 times 100, which is going to be 5,000 times 10, which is 50,000. And this is equal to 60,200. So already notice that like, the difference in association matters quite a lot, yeah? 20,000 is going to be BC, which we've computed in 200 operations which is going to be a 20 by 10, and we're going to multiply that by a 10 by 100, which is D. So we're going to do B times C, and then we're going to take that, store it, and multiply that by D. It would be 20 times 10 by, times 100. Yeah. Questions? Yes? Yeah, it's going to be A times BCD. And BCD is a 20 by 100. And A is a 50 by 20. So the, according to your cost function, it's going to be 50, 20, 100. Yeah. Already notice that choosing, the, uh, choosing an association makes a huge difference. You've halved the number of operations you have to do. And these are just two examples of one. Let's do one final one. Let's suppose we do A, B first. And then let's suppose we do D, C, uh, C D, excuse me. Now what is A? times b, that's going to be 50, 21, right? So that's going to be 50 times 20 or 100 times 10, which is going to be 1,000. Plus uh, cd is going to be 1 times 10 times 100, which is going to be 1,000. And then you're going to be left with a 50 times 1 uh, plus uh, 1 times 100, which is going to equal 5,000, right? So this is, this is going to only be 7,000, right? Uh, so choosing the order of the multiply matrices matters immensely. 7,000 is, is a much smaller number than 120,000. I mean, that's a, that's a difference that a computer would notice. When you hit the Enter key, it's the difference between it finishing instantly and finishing two seconds later. And imagine we had several 
hundred matrices we wanted, several hundred square matrices we wanted to multiply in order. Um, So certainly the difference of where you choose to multiply the matrices matters, right? Um, what's, there's a, let, let's think about like the structure of the problem as, as we've seen it through this example. Uh, a bad way to do this would be brute force search, right? Well, uh, do, we know, do, we have, do any of you know have a ballpark estimate about, about like the mathematical theory about what is the number of parentheticalizations of a certain number of elements? Maybe you've seen it in combo or something? We didn't learn that. Well, um, if you've seen it anywhere else, the, the number of parentheticalizations uh, kind of follows the Catalan numbers, depending on exactly how you formulate it. And the Catalan numbers grow approximately like uh, 4 to the n over n to the 3 halves, something like this. So that's kind of exponential. That's pretty bad. Um, so bad, brute, force, brute force search, already a bad idea, simply because the number of parentheticalizations you have to check is going to be exponential. So, and each one itself will take time uh, to work through the, uh, a, a sum of products. So um, certainly not a, the optimal solution for this. And maybe your next idea might be a greedy algorithm, like maybe you choose to multiply the smallest or the greatest first. Notice that uh, what is the output of multiplying these four matrices? It's going to be a 50 by 100. So it's going to look like 50 by 100, right? It's going to be big. Um, even though internally you have a 20 by 1 and a 1 by 10, those are just uh, vectors and they're transposed. So like maybe you think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to somehow use the greedy way and, and aim for that 1, the minimum value there, so that like at the final multiplication, it's going to be, that's going to be the one I'm going to do. Something like this. Turns out that also doesn't work because you may need that uh, because it's ballparked by the cost function. So you may need that one, which will reduce the cost of multiplications. You may need that somewhere else and not at the final step, something like this. So a greedy algorithm also doesn't really work here to choose parentheticalizations. So what we're really left with is dynamic programming. Sometimes you don't have any other options. You have to think about dynamic pro programming. Um, so really to get into the dynamic programming solution for this, you need to understand like an optimal sub substructure to the problem. You need to understand like, how is this problem phrased in terms of smaller subproblems? And if you think about it, what is an association if not simply like a binary tree, right? So if you think about it, this association is kind of like you do A and B first, and then you do C and D first, and then you do those, right? Or if you were to do, let's say, A, B, C, A, you do B, C, then A, then D, you would do like B, C, uh, then A, and then D, right? Something like this. So it turns out uh, you could think about, and this is also deep mathematical theory with respect to the Catalan numbers, uh, like the binary trees are, the, the, the association can be th thought of as a binary tree. And the reason that's important is because uh, part of a binary tree simply is a binary tree, right? The small, inside a binary tree, there's other binary trees. And that's going to end up being, implicitly at least, our optimal substructure, right? Any questions on the problem formulation, what we're doing here uh, before we get in too deep into it? Yeah? The, mm, the goal explicitly is to minimize the number of operations. And in this example, it turns out that we do that. But if that was the case, then everything would be a binary tree that's quite... Uh, that looks like the merge sort one, that's all nice. But there are some examples you can come up with where the binary tree is not nice. This, the selection of associations must go this way for a certain reason, yeah. The binary tree example is basically to show you that inside a binary tree there's another binary tree. So when you minimize, when you minimize a certain subproblem, you're going to choose from a set of binary trees, and you're going to take the minimum of that, and then you're going to combine it to make a bigger binary tree. So in every DP problem, you have what's called like an optimal substructure. The problem can be thought of recursively. One problem is defined in terms of its smaller subproblems. And you can visualize that with the binary tree. Implicitly, that's what's going to be happening. The algorithm is not going to actually do that, but that's basically what we're going to be choosing. All right? Yes? Can I explain what? The greedy solution would be like, 
uh, either min or max, let's say this one is really nice. Because if you notice in the math, we're not multi multiplying by 10 or 100. We're multiplying by one, by one, by one, or whatever, right? So it's like, um, maybe I save the, I, I, I recursively split it in half by following the one, the minimal in this case, and then I solved each subproblem recursively. I claim you could find a counterexample where the greedy algorithm doesn't work because you may not need the one at the highest level. It's not guaranteed that the last matrix multiplication performed is the most expensive according to the cost function. That's not necessarily true. So you may need the one internally somewhere else. In fact, here, though, it was the minimal, unfortunately. So this is not an example for that. All right. Um, so let's think about, in DP, you always want to think, you want to use the same part of your brain recursively, except you're not going top-down recursion. You're going bottom-up recursion. So you want to phrase a problem in terms of its subproblems. So consider you have matrices 1, A1, A2, dot, 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 An. Okay? And you want to multiply these n matrices together. Um, consider the last operation that you do. What is the last thing that you do? It's going to be uh, somehow you're going to multiply two matrices to get your final answer. Right? Um, but what are those two matrices are? Do you have a selection of choices? Right? So you could do A1, and then you could do A2, An. Right? You could do A1, A2. A3 to An. You could do A1, A2, A3, A4 to An, right? Something like this. So there's a couple selections you could do, and let's just go down the list, and then you could do A1, An minus 1 to An, right? So these are all your options for the last choice you could make, right? And what's going to end up happening is you'll look at these choices and you'll take them in. It's a minimization problem. Every DP, DP problem, extract the key word. It's going to be a min. It's going to be a max. It's going to be a number of ways. If it's a min or a max, you're going to use the min or max function. If it's a number of ways, you're going to use a summation, uh, things like this. right? So we're going to take the min of all the possibilities uh, that we have. Again, in DP, you have a set of choices to make. Everything either is or isn't, whatever your last choice is then all you're going to do is take the min of all your choices and set that to be your value. These are your choices here. You're going to take the min of them, right? But if you think about it, notice that the only difference between these is where you split here, this close open parentheses symbol. It goes here after a1, or it goes after the a2, or it goes after the a3, or it goes after the an minus 1, right? All the way through those. So it's like, given a, uh, a matrices, group them into one half or the other, and then take the min of those. So that's what you're going to do. Now, um, given that, how do you know what a1, a2, a3 is versus a4 to an, right? Well, what you're going to do is you've already computed the minimum cost of a1, a2, a3. And then that is handled, not recursively, but that is stored as a subproblem. That's going to be the answer. So let dp of i comma j equal a min cost to compute uh, a i a j for a j uh, we'll say we'll say i is less than or equal to j. You see that? Yeah. So similar to the longest palindromic subsequence, we're going to go inside and we're going to consider the minimum cost to compute ai to aj, right? Then, for example, let's say the minimum cost was a1, a2, a3, then a4 to an. a1, a2, a3 would be stored dp at 1, 3. And this would be stored at 4n, right? So you've computed all the little miniature ways to do the problem, and then you recombine them with the cost function. That's basically the whole dp recurrence. What is dp of i comma i? Yeah. Wait. Yes. DP of i comma i is the minimum cost to compute ai to ai, and that's well, we've already computed ai to ai, so it's just zero, right? 
Um, what about uh, dp of i and i plus 1? Slightly much harder question, actually, in the spirit of, the, of what we're doing here. And what is the min cost to compute AI times area plus 1? It's going to be the cost function for one round. So if you have AI of dimensions, I don't know, DI minus 1, DI, and then AI plus 1 has dimensions DI, DI plus 1, then this is going to be DI minus 1 times DI times DI plus 1. Right. So why is that the case? The minimum cost to compute AI times AI plus, times plus 1, there's only one way to do it. So the minimum is simply the cost function, right? Any questions on this part so far? Yeah? Cost function is something you can ballpark and estimate. You know? So cost function is d0, d1, d2. We sort of generalize our, our idea of Gaussian elimination, taking n cubed time. So you can change the cost function to other things. But it's a good ballpark of multiplying two rectangular matrices. That the cost to multiply, in terms of cost, we mean the number of operations, multiplications and additions, each taking unit time through whatever hardware circuits you have, um, the minimum number of uh, operations, kind of d0, d1, d2. That's simply generalizing the idea that Gaussian elimination of two square matrices of n by n and n by n takes n cubed time. Right. Um, right. And, and of course, you could replace that with a different cost function if you found something more optimal or whatever. Right. Uh, but it'll always be monotonic anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, Right, so let's define the recurrence then. This was not defined in terms of AI to AJ. It was defined in terms of A1 to AN. So let's define it in terms of AI to AJ. Uh, DP of IJ should be the minimum cost to compute um, AI, excuse me, the minimum cost to compute AI times AI plus 1, dot, 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 all the way to AJ, right? So what is going to be uh, our recurrence? Well, we're simply going to take a min. Now, what are we going to take a min of? We're going to take a min of the, all the possibilities of AI to AJ, right? All the ways you could split it up and do one half and the other. And what is the way you could do the left half? So let's actually call this the minimum k of i less than equal to k less than equal to j. Uh, the minimum ways you could split this up into uh, like a i a k, a k plus 1, a j, right? Where k denotes the last element of the first partition. And k plus 1 is the first element of the last partition, right? So like, for example, in the first line, k equals 1. In the second line, k equals 2. In the third line, k equals 3, and so on, right? So k is going to go between i and j. Here in this, in this, in this set of examples, it goes between 1 and n. Uh, what are we taking the min of, then? What? And what is that? What is both the sides? Yes, it is both the sides. Right. So it's going to be dp of i comma k, and that stores ai to ak. dp of i comma k has been pre-computed and stored in the table, and that's the minimum cost to compute ai to ak, plus dp of k plus 1 comma j, plus what? We're missing a term here. What's the term? Yes. This is left half has been the number of operations for the left half computed and stored. Number of operations for the right half computed and stored. You're concerned with the number of operations to compute AI to AJ, which is this, this 
plus the, t the time it takes to multiply both of these. This is one matrix. This is one matrix. What is the cost to multiply those two matrices? So if you say, uh, for example, like A, A1, A2, da, 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 An has dimensions D0, D1, D1, D2, uh, Dn minus 1, uh, Dn. So suppose matrix Ai has dimensions Ai minus, excuse me, Di minus 1, Di then the cost is, it's going to be the cost function to multiply those two matrices, which is going to be uh, dimensions of, the dimensions of AI to AK is going to be the number of, uh, this is going to be DI minus 1, and then this is going to be DK, right? So when you multiply rectangular matrices, matrices like that, the output is going to be the number of, columns of the first matrix times the number of rows of the second matrix. So this is going to be di minus 1, dk, and then this is going to be dk plus 1 times j, but it's going to be k plus 1 minus 1. So this is going to be dk, the number of rows of ak plus 1 is going to be dk, and the number of columns of aj is going to be dj. So it's going to be dj. That's sort of non-trivial and should take you a second to understand uh, why that's true. <laughs> yes. Simply because the matrices are going A1 to AN, but each matrix has two dimensions and shares it with the next one. So there's N matrices, but there's N plus 1 dimensions. The algorithm is going to take as input the N plus 1 dimensions, D0 to DN not the matrices themselves. It's just going to, given the dimensions, what is the best way to multiply them? And then given that, it's going to, uh, right, you need n plus 1 dimensions for n matrices. Uh, simply because we just index this way, and this is a convention thing, and then if you change the convention, you would change the recurrence. But A1 has dimensions D0, D1. A2 has dimensions D1, D2. And then An has dimensions Dn minus 1, Dn. That's just what we're going to say. And here what I mean by this is D0, D1. Uh, at, at, with the example we have with A, A would be written as like 50, 20. Something like this, right? That's the notation we have, yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So interestingly is the fact that every DP algorithm can be rephrased as a shortest path algorithm in a DAG. And we kind of alluded to this, but didn't go too deep into it. But you can derive a DP algorithm as a shortest path algorithm in a DAG, simply because the memory structure is a graph, and you can represent each cell of your 2D table or 1D table as a node. And then what nodes, as a function, call other nodes, you can put an arrow between them. Right? And that arrow represents a minimum cost. Uh, and then you can represent that as a shortest path in a DAG. Not even necessary to use Dijkstra's. You can use something faster. Uh, but, um, and I think what you mentioned may end up being the thing because, as you'll see, when we compute the algorithm, we're going to compute the minimum cost for every pair of matrices, then every triple of matrices, and then every quadruple of matrices, and so on. Finally, we'll be left with the final answer, right? More questions on the recurrence? Do we understand where, where the cost function comes from? Yeah? Right, here. So basically, this is going to be what? This is going to be AI to AK. And this is going to be uh, K plus 1 to AJ, right? And just by the way we've set up the notation, AI has dimensions DI minus 1 and DI. Right? So, the, the, so for example, A here is a 50 by 20. So I'm writing A, and then I'm writing 50, 20. That's just the notation. So A1 has D0, D1. A2 has D1, D2, and so on. 
Just, that's just the way things are shifted. There's n plus one dimensions for n matrices. That's the only reason we're doing it that way. Um, right, more questions on the recurrence? Every DP problem implementation is usually trivial. The recurrence is the only thing that matters, right? Once you get the recurrence, I mean, it's, uh, the rest of the thing follows pretty easily. Um, one final remark is uh, why did we break it up into twos? Why did we, why was it sufficient for us to break a matrix multiplication, a, a sequence of matrix multiplications associatively in half for what, and K is the split. K is the index of where we're going to put, we're, we're, we're at the top level, we're going to do this problem recursively, this problem recursively. And um, why not consider like two numbers or n numbers or something, like the number of ways to split something up in, 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 into multiple things. Um, and the reason is, and this is not, uh, sort of really a digression rather than something important, is there's no such thing as multiplying three numbers together. Uh, everything is simply a multiplication of two numbers. So for example, you're trying to compute ABC. The only way to do this is either A, B, and then C, or A, and then before B, C, right? So if you're trying to compute the multiplication of three things, it's always necessary, you always have to split it associative, associatively into operations co composed of two things, right? Um, so it doesn't make sense to talk about, you know, how would you split this into three matrix groups because two of those matrix groups would be handled associatively through whatever AI through AK is. AI through AK may itself be split in, like, let's say, A1, A2, and then A3, AK, but that would be determined by computing that subproblem AI to AK, right? So it's sufficient for us to split everything in half and not into thirds or fifths or something weird, right? Yeah? The min is, ah, the min is, we're trying to find the minimum k. So the, this is a notation. Uh, we're basically looping, if you were to implement this, you may loop over it, but you would, for what a value is this minimal? So dp of ik plus k plus 1 to j plus this cost function. What k is this sum minimized? And that is, that cost is the where you split it. You what's the minimum cost of the left half plus the right half plus the cost to recombine, right? Yeah. Mm, I don't think I don't think the matrices are done one at a time. I would not say that. I would say that they're it, it's although DP is always bottom up, especially in this class, and there is top down DP, but we're not really concerned with that technique, it's a little trivial. We're bottom up DP, we're computing every possible sub problem, storing it and writing it down, and then computing the final answer. Um, so it doesn't, I'm not really seeing how a matrix thing is done one at a time, because here, almost recursively, it looks like it's done this recursively, this recursively, and then the com combined cost, right? Well, I'm not sh sure computing the minimums along the way how, the, 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 what really throws you into a wrench here is this sum of the cost function, right? I'm not sure how computing the minimal ones, the minimal of the subproblems may not lead to the minimal answer simply because the cost function to recombine may be expensive. So the structure, I think, is different. It might be related. All right, more questions on the recurrence, which is the most important part before we just implement it real quick. Okay. So like the longest palindromic subsequence, you're going to implement this in a weird, you're going to fill in the table in an odd way. Um, as input, you will not take in the matrices, you will take in the dimensions of the matrices. So you have n plus 1 dimensions, d0 to dn, and those d0, d1, you know, represents the first matrix, d1, d2 represents the second matrix, and so on. Um, allocate dp uh, of size uh, n by n, all zeros, right? So we're going to allocate a dp array um, for i in uh, 1 to n, a dp of i comma i, 
equal to zero. Now, we already allocated it to be zero, so if you were implementing it, it you would not do that. But it's, well, let's make it explicit on the board here. Um, now, what, how, what's the way you want to fill in the table, right? This portion of the table is um, for i is greater than j. But by the definition of the subproblem, we assume that i is less than or equal to j. So this whole, this whole part of the table will not be filled in, right? Yeah. The inputs are n plus 1 numbers, which you can put as pairs if you want. But it's just the number. And then you just, you can, the way I'm presenting it, you could input, input them as n tuples of two numbers each. But notice that every two adjacent matrices share a number. So let, let's simply just give them in this order, and then by the index math, we can know that, for example, the index of a, the, the dimensions of a3 will be d2, d3. This following this way, right? Um, this whole part of the table, the bottom half of the triangle below the diagonal, refers to numbers where j is less than i. So we simply will not write there. Yeah. So I mention it, I write it that way because when you write pseudocode, it has to be, unlike code, pseudocode is not code. Pseudocode needs several properties. It needs to be really easy to read, and it needs to be unambiguous of what the runtime is. Like, looking at the pseudocode, you need to be able to garner quickly, like, what's the estimated costs of certain operations. And then also it needs to be, like, easy to go and implement. You shouldn't use some abstract, complicated libraries or pull in something weird. Um, so when I write it this way, you know, when you allocate memory, that's not really a pseudocode operation. It's actually really a hardware-specific thing, and what's the cost of that? Kind of hard to ballpark. But writing it this way, it makes it clear that allocating a size n array, n by n array, take, should take n squared time. Um, when you declare allocation, sometimes people will say, you know, they fill it in with something initially. But then when they write it in pseudocode, it's not obvious that, that it takes that time to initialize it with something. Like, let's say you compute some value and then put it in the array during the allocation step. Well, that doesn't take n squared time anymore. That takes n squared times whatever the cost of each cell is of allocation, something like this. But you can assume that if you're allocating it all zeros initially, it takes just n squared time, because that's the way the malloc or whatever does it. Yeah? Uh, yeah, if you do it right, yeah. Um, if you fill in your DP in the right order, you will have written to the value before you've ever read from it. So, yes, it actually doesn't matter. Um, but I don't want to uh, think about what happens in a computer architecture system if you alloc something and it's already full of previous memory. I don't know, that sounds like a horror story, sort of, right? You can read other people's memory or something, right? Um, so let's just suppose it's all zeros. It, it, uh, zeroing out a piece of memory takes an, an additional n squared time, so it's like O of n squared still, right? Yeah? Um, yes, but let's just generalize that idea. So we're, you could do, basically what you want to do is you want to fill in this diagonal first. This is, this is ii plus 1. This is ii plus 1. This is ii plus 1, right? This is 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4. So you want to fill in the subproblems of 2 first of consecutive matrices. Then you want to fill in the subproblem of this one, and then this one, and then this one. And then finally, you want to return this one, because that's dp of 1, comma n. Right? This is the final answer you want to return. But you want to fill in the matrix in this order. Now, it's not important that you be able to re-derive, like, okay, how am I going to do that? Instead, you can just memorize the convention, and we talked about this last time, uh, for s in 1 to n, and s is going to be the length of the matrix chain that you're considering. So s being 1, you're going to consider the diagonal, 
S being two, you'll consider pairs of matrices and so on, right? Actually, I think S is not the length of diagonal, but the length of diagonal minus one. Uh, the, excuse me, the length of the, di the chain you're currently looking at minus one. It's going to be an offset to uh, J, so then you do four I in one to N minus S, and then you set J equal to I plus S, right? So given our construction this way, notice that J is always greater than I. But how much it's greater than I is determined by the loop of S. When I equals one, excuse me, when S equals one, we're really looking at I, J is equal to I plus one. So we're looking at I, I plus one, diagonal, right? When S equals two, we're concerned with I is I, and then J is like I plus two, right? So that's gonna be this diagonal. This is I, I plus two, and so on. And that, that's, given this, Formulation of the loop, that's the way it fills in the table. And maybe it would be helpful to memorize that convention. Uh, and then we're simply going to uh, put the recurrence in here. DP of I comma J is equal to the min of the minimum K of DP of I comma K plus DP of K comma J plus uh, di minus one, dk, dj. Now here in pseudocode, we do this quickly. We write min of k, the minimum k, such that this is, the summation is minimal. But this is, if you were to implement this, uh, unless you're using something from a standard library or something, this is done with a loop. So this is not taking unit time uh, because you're looping over a certain number of elements, right? In fact, if you think about it, uh, to compute this one, for example, is going to look at the minimum of this and this. So uh, the mins you'll be taking over, the number of things you'll be looking at, you'll be loop, the, the loop length will decrease, but the things you'll be taking a min over will increase. As i and j get further apart to 1 and n, the values of k will also increase, that it can be possibly, i could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, n, right? So the lengths of the loops will decrease because these become shorter, but then at each step you're comparing the same thing. This is important because it'll make the, uh, analyzing the runtime this way as a, as a, as a, a decreasing summation of or internally it's increasing, uh, it will be tricky to analyze. Now, we simply want to return dp of one comma n, and that's going to be the minimum. Any questions on this implementation? Yeah? Ah, yes. A plus button. Thank you. Yes. More questions? All right, let's do an example. Um, so if we suppose that these were our matrices, um, the input would be D0, D1, D2, D3, uh, D4, and that would be 50, 20, 1, 10, and 100, right? So let's suppose our input is 50, 20, 1, 10, 100, and let's fill in um, our table. This step has a lot of little additions and multiplications, so please double check me as I go through this. I don't want to make any mistakes. Um, allocate a table of n by n. n is four, n plus one numbers, five numbers. So we're only gonna have a four by four table. 
Uh, I am indexing the arrays by 1. It's going to go 1 to n. Because the matrices start at uh, 1 to n. No, n is 4. We're given n plus 1 numbers. The matrices are indexed, and this is a convention, doesn't really matter. And, and matrices are indexed a1 to an. And we want dp of ij to be ai to aj. So dp of 0 doesn't, and at least in this formulation, doesn't make sense. Right. Set the diagonals to be 0. This whole thing, of course, is just going to be crossed out. That doesn't really matter. Um, so now we're going to fill in the table diagonally, this one, this one, this one. Uh, this is going to be dp of what? This is 1, 2. And that's going to be, as according to the uh, formulation, it's the minimum cost to multiply a1 times a2. So it's simply the cost function of a1 times a2, which is going to be d0, d1, d2. And what is 50 times 20 times 1? That's going to be the same, that's 1,000, right? Do we agree? What about dp of uh, 2 comma 3? That's going to be the minimum cost of d1, d2, d3, which is going to be d1, d2, d3, which is 20 times 1 times 10, which is going to be 200. So we put 200 here. And then uh, dp of uh, 3 comma 4 is going to be um, d2, d3, d4, which is also going to be 1,000. Let's take a second, and I want you guys to believe that I filled in the table according to the way the code works. Um, I did i, i plus 1. That's, for I, that's according to s equals 1. So j is simply i plus 1. So we're going to do dp of 1, 2 is going to be 1, 2, or uh, 2, 3, right? Or 3, 4. So it's going to be this diagonal, so to speak, right? Um, now when we want to do this diagonal, so we're going to do dp of... Um, that's going to be 1, 3, right? Now, k, unfortunately, has some range here. So it's going to be the min of the possible values of k, and those are going to be dp of 1, 1, plus... Um, dp of 2 comma 3 plus uh, d0, d1, d, excuse me, d, d1, d3, right? And then the other option is going to be dp of, so this one, is so, this one correlates to a1, a2, a3, but we choose to do a1 by itself and then do a2, a3. The other option we have is a1, a2, a3, right? So that's going to be dp of 1, 2 plus dp of 3, 3 plus d0, d2, d3, right? So the min, you're taking the min of these two things here, and k here is 1, k here is 2. And these are... These are corresponding taking the min of these two things, right? So what is this one? D1 comma 1 is going to be uh, 0 plus D2 comma 3, which is 200, plus D1, D, D0, D1, D3, which is 50 times 20 times 10, which is 500 times 20. What's 500 times 20? That's a 500 times 20. It's not 1,000, it's 500, yeah? Oh, 10,000, yeah, it sounds like 10,000. 50 times 20, let me do the math, let me make sure. Uh, 50 times 20, 50, if I have 50, 20 dollar bill. 50 times 20, 50, that's going to be 500 times 20, which is 1,000 times 10, which is 10,000. Okay, good. The only numbers, I'm serious, the only numbers I know are 0, 1, and n. This is, the computer is supposed to be doing this. Um, that's going to be 10,000, right? So that's the first option, and then the second option is going to be D1, D2, which is 1,000, plus d3, d3, which is 0, plus uh, d0, d2, d3, what is d0, times d2, that's 50, times 100, which is 500, 5,000, right? So 
So the minimum of I think we've made a mistake here. Well, D1 is supposed to be zero. D2, D, D1, D1 is supposed to be, DP11 is supposed to be zero. DP23 is supposed to be 200. And then M0, M1, M3, excuse me, D0, D1, D3 is supposed to be 50 times 20, which is going to be 500 times 2, which is 1,000. And then D3 is supposed to be 10,000. So my notes are incorrect here. So we're taking the minimum. We'll just, we'll just do it live. We're taking the minimum of, of 10,200 and 6,000. Let's double check this one. DP12 is going to be 1,000. DP33 is going to be 0. And then D0, D1, D0, D2, D3 is going to be D0 times D2, which is 1, times D3. Ah, there was 100 there. That's, that's supposed to be here. D3, that's going to be 500, not 5,000. OK. There we go. So the minimum of 1,200 and 1,500 is going to be 1,500, right? So we're going to take this one. So this one is minimal in this case. Uh, and that's 1, 3. So 1, 3 is going to be 1,500. There we go. All right, let's do DP of this one in the diagonal, which is going to be 2, 4. It's going to be equal to the min of our two options, which is going to be DP of 2, 2 uh, plus DP of 3, 4 plus D2, uh, excuse me, D1, D2. 2d4. And then the other option is going to be min of dp of 2, 3 plus dp of 4, 4 plus d1, d3, d4. Right? And that's basically corresponding again to a2, a3, a4. And a2, a3. A4, right? We're taking the min of those two operations. Uh, this is going to be 0 plus dp of 3, comma 4 is 1,000 plus d1, d2, d4 is going to be 20 times 1 times 4, 1,000. So it's 20 times 100, which is 2 times 1,000, which is 2,000. So this is 3,000. This is 2, 3. We've pre-computed as 200. I'm looking over here for that. And then um, dp of 4, 4 is 0. And d1, d3, d4 is going to be 20 times 3 times 4, which is 10 times 100 is 1,000 times 20. So 20 times 1,000 is going to be 20,000. That sounds right. Right? So the minimum of 3,000 and 20,000 is going to be 3,000. Right? Notice that when we did the original formulation, our first two numbers were like 120,000 and 60,000, and then we had 7,000. But notice the table, the numbers aren't even coming anywhere close to that. Right? So there's so much worse answers that you could have when you're, when you're doing matrix multiplication if you're not doing this algorithm. We need to compute one final uh, part. And it's going to be the final answer, which is dp of 1, 4. dp of 1, 4 is going to be equal to the min of, now we don't have two options, we have three options. It's going to be dp of 1, 1 plus dp of 2, 4 plus dp, excuse me, um, plus uh, d0, d 1d4. Uh, then we're going to have dp of 1, 2 
plus two comma plus three comma four, which plus d p of d zero d two d four. Then we have d p of one comma three plus d p of four comma four plus d zero d three d four. Right. We're going to take the min of those three things, and again, just to write out the association, this is a one, a two, a three, a four. And a2, a3, a4 has been computed. Whatever the optimal way to compute that has been done uh, as dp2, comma 4. That's been computed and stored there. This is dp12 plus dp of 3, 4 is going to be a1, a2, a3, a4. And then this one is going to be dp of 1, comma 3. So it's a1, a2, a3, a4, right? So we're going to take the min of those ways to do that. And so given this final answer, you can kind of see how those generalize that way. This one is k value 1, k value 2, k value 3 as well. Um, what are these? dp of 1, comma 1 is going to be 0, plus dp of 2, comma 4 is going to be, we computed that to be uh, 3,000, plus d0, d1, d4, d0, d4. Well, notice actually all of these have d4 in them, so I'm just going to compute and store that. That's going to be... 50 times 100, which is going to be 5 times 1,000, which is 5,000. So we're simply going to take uh, 5,000 and multiply it by all of those. 5,000 times D1 is 20. What's 5,000 times 20? That's going to be 50,000 times 2, which is going to be 100,000. That doesn't sound very nice. Um, what is uh, D1, comma 2 is going to be 1,000 plus... Uh, dp of 3, comma 4 is going to also be 1,000. Plus uh, 5,000 times d2, which is 1. So that's simply going to be 5,000. Um, dp of 1, comma 3 is going to be 1,500. Plus dp of 4, comma 4 is going to be 0. Plus uh, 5,000 times d3, and d3 is 10, so that's 50,000. Now this is going to be 103,000, this is going to be 7,000, and this is going to be uh, 51,500, right? So the final answer is going to be this one. Uh, so we'll just fill this in the table. That's going to be 7,000 here. And if you recall, that's what we got originally for our first answer, uh, dp. Now, we were able to find the optimal solution this way uh, filling in the DP table. But if you notice, we didn't actually store the answer itself. And by answer, I mean the association, uh, what order to actually multiply the matrices in. We simply got what is the minimum cost to multiply the matrices in, but we didn't actually store the answer itself. If we wanted to store the answer itself, what would we do? What information did we, would we need to store at each level to record the answer? Yeah, k itself is the associate is the way you split it up. The minimum k, actually, not just the, 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 the minimum value k. For example, the top level, we have k is 2. So what we know, then, is that the minimum way to split up a1, a2, a3, a4 is, at the top most level, k equals 2. So we know that's the way to split that up. Then for each level, you would also store the minimum k value. So when you compute the min so separately, perhaps in a different table, you store that minimum k value. And then given uh, the minimum k values themselves, you can recombine in exactly what order to multiply the matrices in. Right? Here you know you have to do a1, a2 first, and then do a3, a4. And then you can multiply those two together. That's what the k value of 2 represents. Right? So this is, the, this is the, the chain matrix multiplication technique. Again, it solves a problem, kind of obscure, but it's, there's, there's, it feels like it's the only way you could solve the problem, right? It doesn't seem that there's any other solution to this. And you know, posed, if I pose this problem to you in a setting that was like in an exam or something, it's, uh, it feels almost hopeless. It's a, such an such a easy to formulate problem, but it is kind of, it is pretty hard to, to come up with something that works. And surprisingly, this is a method that works. It's sort of a classic um, in algorithms. Um, any more questions on chain matrix in general? Yeah? No. 
Definitely not. You don't do, you don't loop it through it that way. You have to loop through it in a specific order uh, given this s value. So first you would do the diagonals of all zero. And then you would fill in this diagonal, this diagonal, this diagonal, this diagonal, and then you would return this one element. You have to do it, so when you do DP, every, every time you call the recurrence, it has to be only on cells that have already been filled. For longest sequences and all these other nice ones, you can simply just increase i and j, and that's great, because dp of ij is just dp of i minus 1, j minus 1 or something, right? So you can fill the table in that way. But notice that dp of uh, ij, um, can I solve the recurrence here? Yeah, dp of ij may be dependent upon values that have not been uh, computed yet if you do it that way. So you have to fill in the table in the order that you would call the cells in. Right? You need to ensure dp of k plus 1j has been computed and stored before you even do uh, dp of ij. That has to be the case. And, um, and the only way that you could do it is by doing these anti-diagonals. Right? Diagonal, diagonal, diagonal. Filling in the table is part of the importance of the chain matrix problem. Right? And again, you could, given that we know chain matrix, you could go back and understand longest palindrobic subsequence much easier. Right? Any more questions? Awesome. I will see you guys on Thursday.